Thanks for listening to the Art Tactic Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Green. Last week, one of the most important fairs of the year occurred, Art Basel Hong Kong. Given the Chinese economy overall is in a fragile state with a slumping real estate market and an increasingly authoritative government that's impacted how people are able to spend their money, I know there was a lot of uncertainty headed into the week. So in this week's episode of the podcast, we chat with Lisa Movius, China Bureau Chief at the Art Newspaper, to give us an update on the Chinese art market, as well as how Art Basel Hong Kong went this past week. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for joining us. How have you been? I've been good, thanks, Adam. Great to be back. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure having you on. Well, there's a lot to dig into regarding how the fair went this year, but before we even get into that, you had fantastic coverage, really, of the entire week on the Art Newspaper's website. I definitely recommend our listeners check out your writings if they haven't already. One article you wrote leading up to the fair, you wrote, I'm going to quote you here, this is a make or break year for the Hong Kong art world. So tell us, what, what are the reasons why you thought that was the case, that this specific fair this year was so crucial to the health of the art market there? Well, the Hong Kong art world constitutes a couple of different groups, and each of them have different concerns and reasons why this year was so important. Uh, primarily, there are Hong Kong galleries and also the overall Greater China, the mainland China galleries. All have been through a really rough couple of years uh, with zero COVID and closed borders and now the economic downturn. So they're really relying on, they really rely on Hong Kong Art Week and then the Shanghai Art Week to make the bulk of their sales. And they really needed this year to go well because a lot of guys have, they've survived this long, but it's really a question of how many galleries can survive in the current economy. And then um, that's one group. Then there's also the Hong Kong government has been very, enthusiastically, let's say, uh, boosting art and culture as a way to bring back tourism to the city. And especially because they've been uh, pushing through various political policies that are uh, not exactly popular with the population or with the rest of the world outside of their immediate uh, neighbors to the north. There's a real hope that they can get everyone to embrace sort of art and art as entertainment and art as tourism and art as um, sort of local community as a way to boost the city's reputation and get tourism numbers especially back to normal. Then there's a local scene of artists and curators and institutions who, you know, they never get the same attention as the sales and the big deals during Art Basel week, but they're very active. They're very interesting. They're mostly, well, they used to be very politically outspoken and now they have to be very careful. And they're dealing with a really tough time because a lot of them have emigrated. A lot of people are thinking about emigrating because of the political pressures. And of course, the, you know, the, just the difficulty of living previously during the COVID times. Uh, and so the energy is still really, really strong with the local scene, but it, you know, people are still really struggling to keep that energy going. So you saw a lot of really great small local shows at um, small, you know, locally backed galleries. And it was really important, I think, for them to have a good year. Yeah, it seemed like there was some uncertainty heading into the week, given the slowing Chinese economy. How, how does the economy feel there at the moment? I know there are, of course, several reasons for why an economy may be softening. One I've anecdotally heard within the art world is that the government is making it increasingly difficult for wealthy Chinese collectors to spend their money, in particular on assets like art, especially outside of the country. What are you hearing on that? Well, that's also a couple of questions rolled into one, Adam. So let me break those apart. The economy, as I'm sure your listeners all know very well, has been really suffering in China because of the, you know, the cost of shutting everything down for zero COVID. It's really hard to go from, you know, it was hard to go from 100 to zero, but it's also really hard to go back from zero to 100. And 
this comes at the same time as the long expanding property bubble has finally popped. And then you have things like a small, you know, a shrinking demographic population, you have people trying to emigrate, and you have, you know, sort of a perfect storm that bodes poorly for the economic outlook. So, you know, the government is trying to uh, bolster the mood, it's not necessarily succeeding terribly well. Uh, So, Primarily the bad art, art market, if it is a bad art market, is due to the bad economy. You know, that's that's pretty simple. Um, in terms of what you've been hearing about the uh, restrictions on asset movement, um, those have been in place for several years before COVID. Uh, so they're nothing new. It's possible, and anecdotally, it's possible to really do data on this because people are not going to, you know, come forward and say unless they have something to say and you can't really ask the Chinese government about it per se. Um, It's possible that enforcement is getting stricter. Uh, It also might just be getting more notice because more people are trying to uh, move themselves and or their assets outside of China. Uh, A lot of people I'm hearing are trying to move a portion of their assets abroad, even if they're not personally leaving China. They just want a a backup plan and to get things safe in case there's new like crackdowns on um, if on say tax evasion or uh, corruption and so and so on. So it's possible that what you're hearing how could bear out, but I think um, you know probably statistically speaking, it's not being you know applied that much more than before. Just maybe bigger numbers. Um, in fact, the there might actually be a silver lining to the bad economy in that a lot of people are looking to silver lining for the art market and that a lot of people are looking for assets that are more transportable than property, which is the traditionally preferred asset for mainland Chinese since obviously property you cannot, you know, move to Singapore so easily. Um, there are some restrictions in an art movement, but as long as you're willing to pay the taxes on them, I think it's still fairly mobile as long as it's not an antiquity that China considers like a national treasure. Uh, one thing we have to look out for is if there's new restrictions coming out on moving you know, more modern and contemporary art out of China, then we'll know the government's really worried. And so let's chat a little bit about Art Basel Hong Kong. Overall, how would you say the fair went this year? I think everyone was going in with very measured expectations, given what we all know about the state of the economy. So it was very interesting doing the fair report on opening day because sales came in very, very slowly and very hesitant. And I noticed I was giving a lot of press releases that conveniently omitted any mention of first day sales, even though they were like, first day went great, but no sales mentioned. And so add to that, there's the you know, sour mood or the worried mood at least, or just a weird mood from the passage of Article 23 just a few days before the fair opened. So it's not really changing the situation that much for the overall issue of free speech and political freedom in Hong Kong. It's just one more turd on the shit pile. But, you know, it just doubles down in terms of what everyone is feeling already. And the symbolism is not very helpful to anyone's attitudes towards Hong Kong. Uh, so that was that was in the air as well. So overall, I don't think there were a few massive sales. There were a few outlier galleries that say they sold out, um, but they're not willing to tell anyone they sold out because they don't want to make everyone feel bad, that sort of thing. But I think on the average, most people are just they're not unhappy because they weren't expecting much, but it's sort of maybe was as they expected or slightly better. Obviously, there's a lot more to a fair than just the sales. There's the overall quality of the exhibitions, and there were a lot of really good exhibitions this year, and diversity of artists, backgrounds, um, size, scale, um, back to what we used to see um, in the pre-COVID times. And I think, you know, one thing is I keep an eye on is how much do we see of Hong Kong artists? And there continues to be an increase in how much uh, space and attention local Hong Kong artists get during the fair week. And then, so that's a positive. In terms of like the people in town and the parties, it was definitely a hectic schedule that uh, rival or even outpaced what we would have seen in 2019. Um, I know my feet will not be better for a month at least. And uh, I think all of us said that this, it feels like it was in terms of the busyness of things, it was definitely quite lively. And that kind of, you know, fair adventure um, experience that we all of us were missing for many years. Um, 
So in the terms of the exhibition, it was quite exhibition size. It was, it was pretty good. And the um, aspect of the, you know, what we've been missing for a couple of years is these very, very clueless, um, happy, lost Westerners coming and wandering around and just being like, I'm in Hong Kong. Where is anything? Uh, I'm lost. That sort of element. It's it's very cute to see those come back. <laughs> And one other noticeable trend you wrote about at this year's fair was the increased presence of young Asian buyers. Where are they coming from and how promising is this sign for the art market in China? We were already bound to see a generational shift from in older collectors into younger, especially um, like zero, zero and before and recently born uh, collectors, so in their 20s and 30s now, and you know maybe in their early 40s, but um, generally younger. Uh, maybe they're second generation rich. Maybe they're business people. Uh, maybe they're working in um, like finance or uh, other similar fields. But there's uh, it used to be these big crazy money um, billionaire supposedly or multimillionaire collectors uh, who you know, made a mint in the early years of China's economic boom. And no one is making that kind of new wealth anymore in China because, you know, the city of the country is already so developed. They're not going to have these new uh, property barons on the same level. The property barons are all going to jail for evading their debts after all. Uh, so a lot of the very rich people of before are trying to tamp down their visibility because they're worried about getting in trouble for either corruption drives or they owe a lot of money from their property investments. But you have younger people who are, you know, they're rich, of course, but they're not crazy, crazy rich. So they can afford a couple million dollar paintings, but they can't afford to buy, you know, a couple $10 million at one fair. They probably go in with these moderate, but, you know, a couple million to spend at one fair and want to buy several things. And they have tend to be Western educated, uh, multilingual. They have homes abroad. They're probably raising young children in the UK or the US. Uh, they tend to be, you know, certainly they have, you know, pride in their home countries, but they said tend to have a much broader concept of identity. So they're not going to be so attached into buying either, you know, Chinese artists or um, big name blue chip Western artists. They're more interested in a diversity of options. Um, it's promising in terms of, I think it's going to see a diversification of what's being sold in Hong Kong and in all of Asia. And I think it's going to make for more interesting shows here and more interesting small museums. And I think it's it's much more sustainable than the big, you know, bubble boom buys. Uh, however, you know, it's going to mean a slower purchase because these are not the same kind of massive buyers that we used to see. It also means that galleries have to work harder. There's, I, I'm hearing a lot of uh, complaints that Hong Kong used to be really, really easy to make a lot of money in. And now uh, it's much more challenging. Uh, local galleries, regional galleries have gotten used to this generational shift because they've been selling here for you know the last five years. But a lot of these Western galleries or international galleries that haven't come you know, to Hong Kong since 2019 or before are coming and expecting, you know, the older generation who will drop a lot of money on, you know, old stock and as long as it's a big name. And they're getting these much savvier younger collectors who expect to be treated with more respect. They uh, speak English, so you can't talk behind their backs. Um, and they have a much, you know, they probably understand the global art market better than many of the Western dealers trying to sell to them. So it's, you know, they're a harder market, they're a harder market to impress, but they're also a much more, probably going to be a much more promising demographic to deal with, um, rewarding demographic to deal with going forward. And now that the fair has concluded, where do you feel things stand for the Chinese art market at the moment as we look ahead to the remainder of the year? If we're taking ABHK as an indicator, you know, we've got our work laid out for us and the basically the terrain has changed here fundamentally and it's never going to be exactly like it was before. And that can't be helped. The world changes. There's still a very strong art market here. There's China's a huge country. So even with a terrible economy, it's still going to have a lot of rich people and rich people who are interested in culture and art, whether it's as an asset or as a more engaged collector. Coming up at the end of this month, there's Photo Fair Shanghai, which is a photo-based fair 
that's been running for many years. Um, early May, we have Taipei Dongdai and Art Busan. Um, later in May, we have um, Beijing Gallery Week and the two Beijing fairs. So it's a pretty busy art calendar and all of these things will, you know, we'll have to see what the, how they do and how things uh, sell. No one's expecting anything to go great, but as long as things chug along, along, we'll be pretty happy. And then, you know, the next round of big sales will be um, Korea in September and then Shanghai in November, and then the other uh, mid-sized fairs and uh, art weeks. So it's, it's a busy calendar and it's, everyone's keeping on, keeping on. The economy is probably not gonna improve this year. And the mood is probably not going to be great, given all the political tensions both here and everywhere. So it's one of those, you know, we keep having one survival year after another survival year. But, you know, that's the world we live in. And, you know, as long as the good galleries continue and as long as artists artists don't give up, then we can't give up on them. Definitely. Well, Lisa, thanks so much again for coming on the podcast. We always appreciate your really valuable perspective there in China. And if our listeners haven't already, they should definitely check out all of the, your coverage of Art Basel Hong Kong, which they can find at the Art Newspaper. And you're also on social media, often talking about the art world and art market. Where can our listeners find you there? Uh, I'm primarily active on Twitter under just Lisa Mobius, all written out together. Perfect. Thanks again, Lisa. Thank you, Adam. Always a pleasure.